much for that card. And uh, thank you to the team at Tema Hands for uh, inviting me back. Uh, it's great to be back here and to see the, uh, the community move on and uh, the topics move on. I'm going to talk to you this morning about consumers and the role they can play in tackling climate change. I'm going to talk to you through the uh, results of a report that uh, we at the uh, Sustainable Consumption Institute put together over the course of last year with the collaboration of over 50 uh, consumer goods companies who uh, are members of the Consumer Goods Forum. Uh, some of whom are here today, the people uh, from Migros, from Unilever, from uh, Tesco, uh, and others. So, um, without further ado, <coughs> This report was aimed at bringing something new to the policy debate, something new to businesses' approach to tackling climate change. I says it's, com uh, it's a collaboration, uh, and it's been launched in London uh, late last year, been around uh, New York and Copenhagen, is now in Berlin, and I'm pleased to say next month will be translated into South Korea, into Korea, and will be in South Korea. So we're uh, coming to a place near you soon. The key messages of the report uh, are around why we need to act now. It's a reminder of the challenge before us being very significant uh, that emissions are rising. It's a pointer to why consumers are an important part of the answer and not, as many people often put it, part of the problem. It points us also to, to why businesses have an even more important role to play when you consider the role of the consumers and you look at it through their lens. We argue that significant consumer demand will foster further innovation and make it necessary for businesses to respond to climate change, not just optional. Lastly, and it's the area I'd like to focus on most today, we look at why and how we can change consumer behaviour the interdisciplinary work of the Institute brings together uh, sociology, psychology, economics, as well as some of the hard sciences of uh, carbon footprint and all. But it brings those together into a new model for consumer behaviour that we think can be applied to explore some of the things that uh, the professor was pointing to earlier that we need to better understand con consumer behaviour. We call it the carbon context model. And I'll explain a bit more about that. But first, a reminder, since we have members of the IPCC at the Institute, we are constantly reminded of the important, importance to act now to avoid dangerous climate change. And despite recent challenges, the consensus among scientists is still strong. Yet the message is still clear. Climate change is real and it's caused by us. We heard yesterday, the population is rising, it's not just rising, it's rising forecast to rise by over 40% by 2050, urbanising as well, and getting richer. Those factors mean not only that our consumption footprint of the people in that rising population is growing very fast. Emissions are cumulative as well in the atmosphere, so the pathway with which we cut them is vital. It's important that we act early rather than later to cut those. And the pathway itself is as important as the target. <coughs> so if we cut, sooner, cut emissions sooner, the emissions benefit is greater. And we learn also as we try to make cuts sooner. We concluded that, not surprisingly, that we must engage everyone and use all the tools available if we are to succeed in cutting emissions. And we think that there's an opportunity that's underexplored, underexploited, and not well understood. And that's that changes in consumer behaviour will be part of the answer. In talking with companies, with academics, and pulling together the research, we pulled together that there are six good reasons why consumers are an important part of the answer. Firstly, they're the biggest driver of emissions by far. For everything that we do, as individuals, as companies, as governments, is essentially for or on behalf of the consumer, voters, people, us. 
One study by McKinsey suggested, estimated even, when you talk to them, they just estimated that the potential for savings through consumer behavioral, simple consumer behavioral changes is three to five gigatons by 2030. Those were big numbers when you compare with the, with the targets that are necessary. Secondly, they provide a potentially less expensive route to emission cuts than some of the alternatives. It's probably cheaper, perhaps cheaper, to persuade people to change their lighting behavior than it is to build the equivalent carbon capture and storage facility. And thirdly, their actions can be immediate. We can start now. And to persuade people to change that behavior, behavioral initiatives need not wait for technologies to be installed, designed, approved, adopted. It's probably quicker, again, to get them to drive differently than it is to install the infrastructure for electric vehicles and have them adopted. And fourthly, their habits. Habits are difficult to change, but once you do so, they may last a while. They can stick around for some time, repeating the carbon savings of a newly learned habit again and again and again. As somebody once said, every little helps. In consumer goods terms, you might say it's big, it's cheap, it's available right now, and it's long lasting. One study that illustrates this is from, uh, was presented at a conference on behavior and energy in climate change in Stanford a couple of years ago. The researchers looked through a set of constraints and said, what could we do if we used existing technologies, available technologies today that we can use today, at no cost, negative cost, or a positive return, with no changes in regulation, no new standards, and with no appreciable changes in, in behavior or outcomes for individuals. And they applied those constraints to some energy behaviors in the household, things like insulation, air conditioning, things like uh, other equipment such as televisions or lighting, adjustment and measurement of thermostats, tuning of cars, and daily actions such as drying or washing outside or washing at lower temperatures, driving more slowly. Their analysis showed the striking potential of behavioral change, as you see here. 5% reduction in US emissions within five years, even at even allowing for a, a gradual adoption, rising to perhaps 9% over 10 years, without change, without suffering, without stopping consuming. However, they concluded when they looked at the way in which people were actually doing this, that the levels of investment in energy saving by individuals was actually not rational. People don't invest in these things. They didn't understand why. They called for action on all fronts, multi-channel, multi-target marketing and community-based initiatives. It's a complex problem, behavioural change, and they think it needs a complex answer. <coughs> were any of you counting? Perhaps not. I said there were six good reasons. Here's the other two. <coughs> Consumers can enable low-carbon businesses to prosper. They have a vital influence. If you get consumers to turn, <coughs> to start to turn their behaviors, you will begin to harness the combined power of profit-seeking entrepreneurship. The markets will work in your favor. The nearly 50 global companies who contributed to our research, and the nearly 500 global companies and investors who signed for stronger and binding targets at Copenhagen last year. Called for them. They weren't doing it out of altruism or just from a CSR initiative. They were responding to consumer demand. They were responding to a potential consumer demand. They were trying to create this consumer demand, create opportunities, create markets. <coughs> 
sixth reason is that without strong consumer support and demand, you won't get the policies we need. You won't be able to get the governments to act in step with the challenge we just described, the challenge of acting on climate change quickly. Copenhagen may not have brought the agreement that many people have looked for and hoped for. In fact, Copenhagen or the US climate bill in Congress, or the time it takes to get wind farms approved in Scotland, are all symptoms of the fact that we have to get consumers to empower our politicians to make the policy choices to make a difference. So how can we make, or how should we make, consumers part of the answer? And first, we need to get to the truth of consumption. And the scientists need to get to the truth of the picture of consumption. This map of the world, recast to geographic, on the basis of imports and exports of carbon. You saw yesterday from Petra's slide in the EU, the flows of imported carbon across the world. This recasts that in on the basis of that information. It aligns our understanding of where we consume carbon. It aligns it better with supply chains and better with our life cycle assessments and carbon footprint. It also puts the focus on business as much as governments because businesses have supply chains that cross markets, cross boundaries. So if you take a consumption-based view, you put in you get closer to the truth of where we're consuming, closer to the truth of the drivers of the emissions, and you open up new policy instruments. And I would call upon policy, I'm afraid Petra's not here, but I would call upon people looking at policy to think about consumption, not just production-based instruments. You can take it a bit further. This is toys. <coughs> where it's important to. If we understand better our toy uh, supply chains and how we consume, we can develop better instruments. It's more dramatic. And this is where they're coming from. Product carbon footprinting can help us, will help us, deliver lower carbon products. But I believe that there's a lot more potential in the science and call it that, of product carbon footprint. It will help send strong signals down the supply chain. It will help identify and tackling the hotspots and improving design and lower cost solutions. But understanding the use base, the consumer base is at the front end, in helping us inform the consumer and driving choice, driving behavior, is an area I think we can explore further. How can we use these learnings from product carbon footprinting to design better products with lower carbon use in mind, not just lower carbon production in mind? How can we help drive behaviours by looking through a behavioural or use lens? We put together at the Institute a model which helps us, we think, frame some of those questions. We call it a carbon context model for consumption. Our habits are the strongest drivers of how we consume. The habits take place in different contexts. Our behaviours are driven by the individual, the social and the material context. And to try and understand what this means, let's take an example from laundry. The individual context here <coughs> covers the products we consume and how we use them, what type of powder we use, what type of material, uh, uh, what type of machine we use, what temperature we run it at. The social context reflects the influence of social parameters on our lifestyle, how often we wash our clothes, how we dry them, how, we see, how often we change them. Material context reflects the available technologies the materials that clothes are made from, and the availability of machines, or washing machines, or powders that we use to clean them. The point here is that affecting change of a behaviour 
such as washing clothes, requires us to think about all three contexts. It's more than just an isolated price campaign or marketing campaign that would address just the one. You need to change the material, the structures, and the social context, the norms in which we do our clothes washing. Look a bit more detail. Getting the price and the incentives right is vital to encourage consumers to substitute a good, low-carbon product for a high-carbon one, or for, simple, or for changing their recycling behaviour. We looked yesterday at some incentives for households for purchasing uh, lower-carbon products or for recycling. Sharing information may help build awareness of the issues and holds the possibility of longer-lasting changes. People learn why they need to do things. It's here we need to raise carbon consciousness and literacy, as we discussed yesterday, from the schools up. And carbon labelling is but one part of that, one factor there. At present, there's limited research on the effectiveness of information campaigns, but some pointers in the literature. One example, well, what some pointers in the literature tell us that you can't use it as a blunt tool. As an example, in California in the 80s, utility companies spent over $200 million advertising the benefits of residential energy efficiency and measures in household energy. But household energy didn't change. The Pacific Gas and Electricity Company spent more money advertising that you should change your light bulbs and insulate your house than it would have cost them to directly install that installation in every one of the people they were trying to reach. <coughs> Information on its own is not going to be enough. A couple of the barriers to using information or concern, considerations uh, on the individual context is that individually, the rebound effect, the academics talk about this effect, if you save money on household energy, you might spend it on foreign holidays which are high carbon, or if you save time, you will use it on higher carbon initiatives, uh, higher carbon alternatives. The free rider problem also points to the fact that <laughs> if you don't see others playing their part, then you're less likely to act yourself. So just talking to the individual with price and information is not enough. Because all our consumption activities <laughs> though we're seldom conscious of it, it take place in cultural conventions. They're guided by social norms. As societies get richer, time pressures become a greater driver of how we eat, for instance, leading to greater demand for pre-prepared meals, eating out, and more refrigeration at home, changing the carbon footprint of the practice, not the product. It's not just Western societies either. Studies of Indian homes show that as societies change from more extended families to nuclear families, and as women work more, there's greater demand for refrigeration, growing the footprints of those households. Here are some strategies we saw adopted by the companies we talked to who were looking to use the social context in the way they influence behaviour. For example, Migros using, teaming up with Disney for recycling, or Tesco using celebrities to help reduce carrier bag usage. And we saw yesterday, I think it was South Korea, using uh, actresses and a famous mountaineer, was it, uh, to uh, share information about their programs. Here's a neat example. I don't know how many of you staying in a hotel last, last night would have had one of those little cards in the bathroom saying, help save the environment, please reuse your towel. There have been several behavioral studies of these, these sorts of uh, messages. This is one from the US. They changed the message slightly. Instead of just save the environment, join your fellow guests, be part of that quote community, and help save the environment, please reuse your towel. <laughs> towel reuse went up by over 25% the footprint down by a corresponding amount. Just reaching to that social context, the fact you're not doing it as an individual, you're part of a community, a 
people you might meet in the bar later. It's significant in its own narrow way. It's cheap, it's positive, and it's available right now. The material context I mentioned earlier is just as important. In other words, the range of technologies and infrastructures that are around us, they're available for us as we decide how and what to consume. Unless they're available in the right combinations of products, services and infrastructure, consumers won't be able to act. When you buy something, it's rarely used in isolation. There's no point buying shower gel if you don't have a shower. Microwaves will tend to make you buy more ready meals. Dishwashers make you buy more cutlery. Technologies can also script behavior. A washing machine could default to only operate at lower temperatures or to start operating at that and require you to nudge you to change it to operate at a higher temperature. If it started that way, it would script your behavior. It would make savings. We can use the lessons of LCA and PCA to design products that script behaviours if we think about how those products are used. Pulling it all together, if you're talking to the head of CSR or marketing in a company about promoting low carbon products and about the use of product carbon footprinting and how that will help change people's behaviour, Think about the whole three contexts and pulling it together. When they're considering promoting a program, think about carbon labels in campaigns, but not on their own. Advertising and communication that brings in the community. And how those products or services that your company or organisation is talking about, how those work in the material context. One simple example, that's uh, often used, so forgive me if you've uh, seen this before, aerial, or washing at lower temperatures, was a successful campaign to get people to turn down the temperature uh, of their washing. Why is that? Well, they did life cycle analysis if, a long time ago now, which pointed to 70 or 80%, depending on how you measure it, of the footprint of washing coming from the use phase. They shared that information, not alone, but in lots, through lots of channels, uh, carbon footprint, uh, on packets, information in stores, on packets. They did advertising in the social context and their community groups about washing behaviours. And they also worked with companies such as those you saw yesterday to develop enzymes to be able to have powders that will wash at lower and lower temperatures, working also with the manufacturers of machines, so those would work at lower temperatures. Pulling it all together took time, but over five years, in, in one study, they showed that people washing below 30 rose from just 2% of the population up to 17 in the UK. So it needs to be pulled together. In summary, we need to act now to fight climate change. And consumers are part of the answer, an important part of the answer that we need to understand more. If you drive that, you will drive more innovation in the supply chain, making more low carbon products available. But to have those adopted and used in the right way, we need to unlock that demand and we need to understand better the behaviours that drive the way in which those products and services are used. There are six good reasons and I have six copies of the report here, the six people who can tell me what those reasons are. Awesome. Can anyone remember, for first, why consumers are part of the answer? No one was paying attention. One, yes, James. B. B, yes. First report to James. Anyone else? Now. It's now, available now. It's cheap. That's three. It's fast. Sort of. Four. Any more? <laughs> it's long lasting, good. And it enables low carbon business. And it helps to change regulation. Yes, it puts pressure on the city. So there are good reasons, and some people can remember them. Uh -huh. For those who do, there's six copies here. Thank you very much.